So I tell people that this is a six hour tutorial, so I hope you guys brought snacks. Uh, because the topic of taking a very large monolithic app and turning it into a bunch of services isn't something that you can really get your head around in 40 minutes or in an hour or really in six hours. Like This would be a disservice to think that you're going to walk out of here saying, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. I'm going to have these network services. I'm going to put microservices all up everywhere. And it's all just going to work. Uh, there's a funny tweet that someone made about this concept and said, um, if you show me your huge monolithic app uh, with a bunch of uh, problems, I can tell you how to turn it into a bunch of microservices with a bunch of problems. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the path that we wanted to avoid in how we get there, is we didn't want to just take exactly what we were doing and just push the problem off to a different, uh, or different set of apps. So what are we actually going to talk about if we're not going to talk about the full, how do you get there, and code samples, and give you a recipe for how can you do it. Well, we're going to talk about the problem that we're solving. We're going to talk about why do we want to do this. Like, is this something that we should just do because, hey, we heard it was cool. There was a few articles that Uncle Bob published that said you should do microservices, or Martin Fowler said you shouldn't, or whatever, so we should just do it. Um, we're also going to talk about why, what motivates us specifically, but what should motivate you to go towards a service-oriented architecture. And then we're going to talk about how can you implement this. So how can you actually start approaching this particular problem? So to, to really do this topic justice, we need to talk about the evolution of application architecture that most developers go through when they start uh, programming. So there is a, I call it a progression of understanding of architectures. And it usually starts the same for most people. But it doesn't have to be, like, just because you, if, you have, if you don't feel like you're on this particular path, or you don't feel like this describes how you learned about architecture, uh, don't feel like it's, you're doing something wrong. It's just this is what most people go through, um, through people that I've talked to and mentored about this, this particular concept. So most applications today, they're going to follow MVC-ish architecture. So M I call them MVC-inspired because they're all different. just depends on what language or what framework you're using. But uh, their, their application is designed around this implementation pattern. That's generally how it works out. There's other, there's other similar uh, patterns that have come up recently. There's one called Action Domain Responder by a guy named Paul Jones. And he kind of takes, it's essentially MVC boiled, boiled down to make it look exactly like how the web works. So uh, it's, it's gaining traction, Action Domain Responder is, because it, it helps people understand exactly how MVC really fits into uh, the web. So we talked about this idea of a natural progression, but uh, what, does that, what does that really look like when you're, when you're starting out as a developer? Where do you generally start with your application, uh, with your architecture? That's what it looks like. It's a big box with a bunch of lines drawn in it that don't really make any sense. There's no way to tell kind of where things, where things start, where things end. There's really not any discernible structure because you were just kind of hacking together something. You were saying, I've got this problem, I need to solve it. Let me write 8,000 lines of code, and there's my solution when you only needed 20 lines to actually do it. Uh, but this is, this is where people generally start with uh, programming and with architecture, is they understand that their application is this box, and inside of it is do these things. Then you, you, you start learning a little bit. You start looking at you know, the problems with this, and over time, the maintenance of dealing with an application that looks like that uh, becomes too great. So you start looking for, how can I solve that particular problem? And you end up with something that we're going to call libs. Now, it doesn't have to be in a lib directory. It doesn't have to be um, other people's libraries. It could be your own that you're writing. Uh, but generally, this is what it looks like. You have this huge mass on top of, hey, these libraries that I pulled in from you know, Ruby gems or uh, packages if you're doing PHP or uh, PyPy if you're doing Python or whatever. So you've got these libraries, and they kind of make up your actual ar architecture. It's, I've got all this code that does something, and it uses these structured um, libraries to accomplish its goal. But you haven't really solved much of anything by doing this. You end up just adding in some, some reusable code, but for the most part, you still have a mess. So you go looking a little further, and you usually end up in some sort of framework that tells you how you should design your app. And they tell you you should put your models here, and your controllers here, and your views here. And that's kind of how this whole thing works. So this is what I call a typical um, MVC-inspired architecture. And it's where we, we kind of just shove as much logic as we can into one of these layers. So depending on whose blog post you read, or who 
who you follow on Twitter or whatever, you may shove more stuff into controllers, you may shove more stuff into models, you may work in a rail shop where you have active record models that are 10,000 lines long, and that's the pattern is, I've got this structure that someone told me was a good idea, so I'm gonna use that, and that's, that's fine. Like, that works for some amount of time. So what does that look like uh, from an application standpoint? How does, how does, how does a end user, how does a customer, how does someone who's using your web app interact with this? Well, it generally looks like this, where you have, you have your end user who's talking to your application, who talks to your business logic, who then talks to your database. So it's generally a funnel that goes straight down. It's everything that happens kind of just follows this pattern where uh, if we looked at how it looks like in MVC, we might say it's something along these lines. Uh, this is, like I said, this isn't a definitive MVC tutorial, but uh, this is kind of what it looks like in a lot of people's um, code. They end up with views that kind of live in this application layer, and then controllers do some sort of job that deals with you know, the application, maybe deals with business logic, maybe it's dealing with services that do some of the work for us. And then we have models, which are these huge things, like the you know, fat model, skinny controllers concept, where you know, we want to put everything into this models directory, and this is where our code lives. So if you looked at this, the actual application, you could say it looks something like this. And this is a monolithic app. The monolithic app represents all the business logic, all of your database interaction. It's all contained in this, in this right section. It is your models, your controllers, your views, and then some sort of database where you're storing everything. It could be Mongo, it could be MySQL, whatever, whatever you're using. But that's what it looks like. And that works for a long time. It worked for uh, the application I work on for about 10 years. Um, so this is fine. This isn't a bad architecture. But you reach a point where you can look at this and say, maybe there's a problem. And that usually comes up with, after a decade of life, this is going to have, you know, and these are, these are kind of simple numbers, but I counted 58 controllers in one of our apps and 153 models. And that's, you know, you want to work on something, you're going to touch those. And then every time you want to add something, you want to add a feature, you're going to have to add new controllers and new models. So over time, this, this application just keeps growing and growing and growing until you have 10 million lines of code and three developers working on it. And they're like, well, I don't know. I, I guess this is a model function, so I'll just put it in here. And maybe this is a controller. And you end up with something unwieldy, something that's almost um, impossible to work on. Because modifying existing things, so modifying existing controllers, modifying existing mo uh, models, is going to mean that you have to change many other controllers. Because in this architecture, you end up crossing boundaries. So you end up with a concept that's spread out in 10 models or 10 controllers. Like the idea of completing a purchase. It requires going to this controller. Great. Then it talks to these 10 models, which deal with you know, line items in my... Uh, my uh, manifest or whatever. So you've got tons of things that all interact together, and that's the only way to get anything done in your app. So the problem we're solving is that adding things to our monolithic app is very time in intensive, and it takes a lot of effort from everybody on the team. There isn't really a time when you can say, hey, I'm going to go through and I'm going to be, I'm going to be the, you know, expert on purchase completion or whatever. Like there is no concept of that. that. That concept is spread out through tons of things. So anytime you touch one, you have to touch another and another and another. So in short, a monolithic application becomes a greedy application in respect to your team's time. It ends up taking more time than it's worth to maintain. So if we go look and we go look at this monolithic application, uh, you can see that uh, the application, the database, um, they, they kind of handle everything together. So there's no concept that your app can survive without a database or this exact database. They're, exclusive, they're, they're tied together. There is no way to separate my business logic from the structure of my database. They are, they are tied. They're, they're coupled. So what if, what if we need to interact with things in a different way? Or we need to, inter we need to store things in... Uh, for example, we need to use Neo4j to deal with some hierarchical, hierarchical structure, but we only have MySQL available to us. We need, we need a way to interact with things in smaller apps. That's where the service-oriented app comes in. Now, uh, this, is, this is kind of what our application looks like if you had a bunch more services going around right now. So you have your monolithic app. 
you still have this concept because there is so much built into there. There's no way you're going to be able to say, I'll just put that to the side and work on it later. But we, we have decreased the responsibility of this monolithic app by introducing these other applications that are services. And what they do is they do parts of functionality that used to be inside this monolithic app, we've split them out. And the benefit to doing that is now if, for example, one of these does uh, payment processing. If I want to look at how payments are dealt with in the system, how payments are represented, um, how we store them, how we deal with them, I don't have to go digging through 35 different models to figure out a payment exists here, you refund it, it goes through this one. Uh, when you do this, this, this interaction happens here. I now go look here, a much smaller, more directly focused application. It's much easier to maintain. It's much easier for one person to understand or for a team to work on because if you need to mess with payments, where do you go? A payment service. You don't touch this giant ball of mud. So if you wanted to define the difference between a monolithic application and a service-oriented application, I would say that a monolithic application is a single code base responsible for handling everything. So this, this code base, if you say, I want to perform a function, it is definitely going through that particular app. Whereas a service-oriented code base is uh, something that's, or a service-oriented application is a set of, compo of code bases that are working together to solve a goal, and each one of those code bases does one thing or is responsible for one concept. It's, I think it's important to make that distinction between does one thing and, and represents one concept because you know one thing you could say any more microservice world you could say this all the service does is process payments that's it so anytime I want to deal that, deal with that it's this service you could also represent all payments as one service so depending on where you want to go with your app um, it is just a whole bunch of code bases that interact together so then that brings us to the question of do you even need to use service order architecture. Like, why would you want to do that? Well, I can tell you right now, the chances are the answer to that question is no. 99% um, of applications, I'm just making that up, but I would say a large portion of applications are never gonna need to go service order art, like architecture route. There's no, there, there, this isn't the, oh, if we do service order architecture, we've now solved ourselves for future proofing. We're now, we're now gonna last 20 more years because we've got the service order app. It doesn't work that way. It is just a solution to a very particular uh, problem. So why would you want to look at service order architecture? Well, uh, the, like, the primary benefit for us using it is it, it reduces the complexity of how things are represented in our system by removing all these um, unnecessary dependencies. So um, some examples of that would be we used to have payments and there was uh, two different types of payments we could take, well three really, like PayPal, uh, credit cards, or gift cards. So if you went to look at payments in the monolithic app, you would go look at gift cards, and so all things were kind of, we were issuing them ourselves, they were interacting with the database directly. And then if you wanted to look at credit cards, they were through authorized.net, and then you could look at PayPal, which did credit cards and everything else, but um, they were three distinct sets of code within the application. We moved that into a payment service, which we call Piggy Bank. Yeah. Uh, so a Piggy Bank handles all of our money now. So now instead of, if I need to look at credit cards, I go look at this monolithic app, the authorized.net um, gem or whatever. I can now go look at my payment service and know that every payment in the system from you know, this point forward is always gonna go through there. So this idea of a payment is now decoupled from how it's implemented, which processor we're using. It is just a payment inside of our app. Uh, the next thing is service-oriented architectures make your deployments a lot easier. I didn't say less complex, I said easier. And the reason for this is if you work on payments in, in our app, you don't have to deploy our huge app that has a much longer deploy time. You can just deploy the payment service. So a new version of that comes out, you just deploy it and you're done. So it makes things independent of each other. Well, yes, but the goal is to separate the concepts so that you're not, yeah. Um, it also provides an easy way to divide work and to parallelize. So um, an example of this would be, we were working on um, checkout for our app and we had you know, three different concepts that were in play. We've got orders, we've got inventory, and we've got uh, payments. We kind of decided on the contracts for how those would interact with each other up front, and then we could 
three of us could go work on things independently of each other, and then we could come, and then it would be brought together in services, and it would just work. I, I, it didn't just work, but theoretically, it would just work. Um, it also makes it substantially easier for you to mix technology. So maybe you're working on a large PHP app and you're like, this sucks, I want to work on a Rails app, or I want to use Node, or something to that effect. Um, having independent services that don't, that don't uh, depend on each other means that you can implement things in whatever languages you want. And then finally, it gives you uh, the, the freedom to easily scale. So if, for example, we notice that payments is our... our uh, dragging point is call it causing us problems. We can spin up 10 payment services and everything will just um, work through our routing and it doesn't care that it's going to one of these 10 things. It just knows that I'm talking about a payment. So the, the drawbacks um, for service order architecture is managing multiple code bases is hard. So uh, this is something that we felt very early on where we have you know five different five different apps running, so dealing with five different repos um, as one developer is very difficult to think of. So that's where you learn more, or you lean more towards the concept of ownership of, of concepts in your app. Uh, more code bases is always going to mean more dependencies, and your development environments become more complex. So this is a problem that's very hard to solve, um, where you have 10 services that make up your app, 10 APIs, theoretically. Um, how do you start that up in, in your local environment? Do you spin up 10 Vagrant VMs? Um, yeah, we did that. If you want to do actual work, that's not a good route to go. But, um, so it, it makes that more compli complicated. And then finally, it's, it's a lot more difficult to look at and understand, this is my app. This is how the whole thing works. You now have to understand how things interact with each other if you want to look at a holistic view. Uh, we personally don't. Um, we don't err towards that side. We look at how do you interact with our app, and our app now consists of two different apps, one that's the actual client, and then one that is the system of services. So we don't look at it from a, how does the whole thing look? We just look, how do you interact with these concepts? So, um, so when you should use it is, you've got a very large code base, it's cumbersome to deal with, your team is large enough that you can specialize and separate um, concepts to give them to people. That's when you would use service-oriented architecture. Also, when you have an API-driven product, so you're wanting to provide a platform for other people to consume, uh, service-oriented architecture is the way to go. You need independent scalability. So this was that concept where you know, you've got a bottleneck inside um, your app in your payment service. You need it to scale. You can do that with service-oriented architecture. And then finally, you're bored and you want to tell your friends how cool you are and you did service-oriented architecture. That's definitely a, a reason. So. What do you need in order to do service oriented architecture? Uh, you need to have experienced developers that are capable of building out APIs um, and dealing with concepts in abstract fashion. So if you don't have that, you know, you're not, you're not going to succeed at this very, very quickly. You need time. Time is an important factor in this. Like it's, not, it's not easy to go look at a system that's 10 years old and take one concept out of it. It takes a long time to build that up. And then the final one is you need the ability to reject feature requests. So trying to go down the path of developing this robust service platform while you're still adding a whole bunch of new features on top of it, uh, you're going to end up with, instead of three-month timelines, you're going to end up with 12-month timelines. It, just, it is too complicated to try to do both at the same time. So things you don't have are these three things that I talked about, uh, most likely. Uh, in our case, we absolutely do not have the ability to reject feature requests. We have to keep building a product. So how do you go about introducing um, service order architecture into a monolithic environment? I was posed this question a couple years ago, and I made this little presentation for my company and uh, presented it to my uh, coworkers, and they all hated me because I called it monolithic SOA, and that kind of stuck. We now call it SOA Lite, but um, we... You know, the concept here is we don't need to go about building 10 different distributed systems right now. Like, we don't need to have these apps deployable on their own and interacting outside of um, a container. What we need is we need the ability to figure out which one of these services needs to scale. We need the ability to look at and see, you know, how does this system as a whole interact? Um, so I decided to say, what if... What if instead of looking at a, a true service-oriented app where we're literally just going through this monolithic app and cutting things out, turning them into their own remote services, what if instead we kind of cheated and we still have our monolithic app, 
But now we build apps around that monolithic app that still talk to the same database. Now, this is absolutely an anti-pattern um, in service-oriented architecture to use the same database because it is extremely tempting when you're working in this app, which has a very specific concept and a very specific purpose, to go use some data in here that's for some other concept. It is very, very easy for you to break that line. So we actually do this now, though. Uh, we are using this anti-pattern as a good pattern for us uh, right now. But it is extremely intensive in the code review process. You have to be very vigilant about saying, no, you can't just bring this data in because it's convenient. You need to build the services out the way they're supposed to be built. So what does that kind of look like now? Well, we still have our giant monolithic app that has libs in it. And then we also have a second app, which kind of w looks like an MVC app, but it has this additional layer, this services layer. And essentially what that does is that allows us to build services in a monolithic container while exposing them to the app itself as if they were remote services. So for our case, uh, what that looks like is we've got these services that are called service clients and you interact with, um, at this point, this is a Rails app, this is a PHP app. Um, this one interacts through active record in the services area, so these two are kind of tied together. So when you ask for a payment or you ask for an order, it's gonna go hit the database. But the um, controllers that interact outside of it, they work like actual APIs. So you, you have abstracted the idea so that any of this code that's using um, your services, once you've broken or taken a service outside of this container and built it on its own, you rewrite the service layer. In instead of rewriting all of this, you just rewrite the service layer, and instead of interacting with Active Record, it interacts with a remote API somewhere. So uh, we've actually done this for one of our services right now. We've gone through the whole process. And that was our uh, payments app. So what it looked like when, when we started this process was we had a monolithic app and it talked to authorize.net. We ran into a problem where authorize.net goes down. Uh, we cannot take any payments. We wanted to add a second one. So we wanted to add Braintree into the mix. Uh, doing this in this way uh, was not really something that we wanted to go down the path of because it's, you're adding a whole bunch of knowledge about switching gateways and it makes it impossible to go through and say, I'm going to take one of these out or I'm going to automatically fail over between them or I'm going to send some payments to this provider, some to this provider based on some rules. So we decided that we would put a service in between. So we made our own, uh, our own service that we called Piggy Bank, like I said, and basically what it does is it abstracts the idea of a actual payment provider. So now our app, our app on the left side, it talks to piggy bank and then piggy bank decides, okay, this was actually an authorized.net transaction. I should go refund it here. Or, you know, these particular credit cards I need to run through Braintree because they're Canadian dollars. So we've got some things set up here. Um, Realistic right now, we don't use authorized.net anymore. We use Braintree and Stripe, uh, but it's a similar concept. Like it allowed us to make that that whole process a lot easier. So uh, essentially what it looks like is we have a payment gateway interface, which allows us to, in our app, uh, in our PHP app, it allows us to do charges and refunds and a whole bunch of other things, but charge and refund is basic, the basic functionality that we need to deal with. Um, so that interface allows us to just, you know, we can use any, any payment provider we want to, including our own. So what it looked like at first, we had an authorized gateway, which allowed us to use authorizes library and just go through and actually create payments there. Then we added a Braintree gateway and that allowed us to do the same thing, but now we had to switch based on you know, information about a payment, which one of these gateways we would use. So uh, we, moved on to, uh, we, we moved on to implementing uh, a factory that dealt with that particular problem and allowed us to go through and we had our gift cards that we implemented ourselves, uh, we had Braintree and we had authorize. But we didn't really like this. this. This code base was very difficult to deal with. Um, so we decided at that point, let's actually make this service real. Um, and what that looks like um, now is now instead of having a specific uh, payment gateway for every single, every single gateway we have, we just have this payment service client that talks to our piggy bank service. And it deals with a charge request through um, HTTP. So now instead of I need to talk to Braintree, I need to talk to authorize.net, it just says payment service, you deal with this, I need to refund or I need to charge. Um, so what that allowed us to do then 
is uh, change all of our code that dealt with dealing with specific gateways to just talk to our payment service client. So now we have no dependency on authorizes gems or authorizes uh, bundles or whatever. We don't have to deal with any of that. All we deal with is our own stuff. So that cut our code in here, which we left in place, down significantly. Now instead of dealing with authorize, Braintree, and gift cards independently, every single payment goes through that gateway. So what have we achieved by going this route? Well, if we look at our, our original diagram, where we have this kind of MVC-inspired um, concept, we've changed it from, you know, an user talks to an application, which is this huge ball of mud, to an as user talks to an application, which talks to some services, which have some business logic, but also talks to business logic, which talks to the database. So we've made it significantly more complicated, right? Like this is much more complicated now, but it's easier to understand when you, when you know the services and the specific concept you're looking at, like payments. So what it looks like in real practice, um, this is as close as I could get to diagramming what our actual, what our actual system looks like. Uh, we have our PHP app, our big ball of mud. We have our service container here, and then we have a real service in the middle, which is our payment service. So our, our uh, services app can talk through its service client here to this uh, piggy bank app, and then our large monolithic app can also talk to it here. So this gives us the freedom to now we have a JavaScript app, or we could make um, our iOS app, or we could make an Android app that talks to these services um, through these controllers, um, which are all housed inside one large container, which is a Rails app. This, uh, this is kind of the future of where we're going, is each of, these, each of these services will eventually become their own entity. So they will be taken out of this container once we decide that we need to for scalability reasons, or when we need to for understandability reasons. So if it doesn't make sense to continually have it interact with the database um, through Active Record, we would break it out at that point and we could turn it into a Go app, we could turn it into a PHP app, whatever we wanted. So it gives us a lot of freedom and flexibility without a huge amount of cost. So uh, to recap, much like the evolution of most developers' um, understanding of architectures, the evolution from a monolithic app to a service one is something that uh, is not going to be fast. It's not going to be something that you're going to go home and decide you're going to do this, and then two months from now you're going to have 10 services spun up and running. I mean, if you had 150 engineers or so, maybe you could do that. Uh, but for the most part, it is a gradual process of understanding concepts in your monolithic app and turning them into um, services. Uh, service or architecture is, uh, is very powerful. It is something that allows you a great amount of flexibility, uh, but it's only useful in certain situations. Like, you know, we talked about, you know, why you would want to use it. Um, you wouldn't just use it just for fun. Well, I mean, you can just for playing, but I wouldn't suggest doing that at a company because it's a long process. And then um, it's possible to build towards service or architecture. So if you know that in the future you need to provide this flexible platform for other people to interact with, um, it is very easy for you to go about uh, going in that direction, that whole service container concept, uh, without needing to unduly burden yourself or your ops team, or if you're both, I, I'm sorry. But uh, you don't have to unduly burden the concept of, I've got 15 different repositories, all of them are deployed differently um, into these containers in, in the cloud, and I hope it all works together. Uh, I would advise against starting there. So that's all I have. Um, if you're not familiar with Joined In, the link for this one is Joined In 13894. Um, I would appreciate any feedback you have. This is the second time I've, talked, I've gone through this particular talk, so anything that you think I might need to expand on or cut back on, I would really appreciate that. Um, and I also like it when people tweet stupid things that I say. I didn't mention this at the beginning, but if I said something dumb that you remember, um, tweet it and mention it to me because it's, it's humorous for me. So, um, Anyone have any questions? I know somebody does, yeah. yeah what are you using uh, for communication between your services? Uh, so, uh, good question. So, uh, between, we, we're basically, all of our services are RESTful, we're passing JSON over. Uh, we're following JSON API spec um, for most of our stuff, um, just because we like the way it interacts. Um, it gives us some flexibility. It, that is a, another step on its own that's very complicated, is to figure out how you're going to build out an API that kind of cohesively works together when you've got distributed systems. But uh, yeah, so we, we communicate mostly over HTTP. Uh, my OK. 
Okay, in your view, what kind of uh, problems qualifies for a service-oriented architecture? Uh, so his question is, what, what problems do I think um, would necessitate going service-oriented? Well, I mean, the biggest one is you want to switch from the idea of I've got an app to I've got a platform that apps can be built upon. Like, that's really the, the key for us is we notice that we have a huge app, and then we've got an iOS app, and they kind of interact differently with our systems. And we wanted to say, you know, instead of dealing with, uh, for the payments example, instead of everything having to go through this app or having to go through these, uh, this iOS app, I want to be able to say payments are an independent concept. So once you reach the point where you know, payments are not unique to your app, but they're just something that your, your platform provides, um, that opens up a lot of doors. So an example would be, uh, we have a partner that, want, that works with us, and they want to be able to do some more complicated um, ticket purchasing concepts. So we, we sell ski lift tickets. Um, so they want to do some more complicated purchases where you could buy a pass, for example, and then it would be automatically attached to a credit card where you go through their lifts and it keeps track of, you know, hey, this person went through this lift with this pass and it batches to us, charge them this much money now. Um, so before in our old system, there was no way we could support that because a payment was a very specific concept to it's attached to an order. It has to be this way. But now with the with the idea of payments being an external service, now we can tell them, sure, here's, here's an API key, you can interact with a payment service, and we can batch them that way. So it, the problems need to lend themselves well to having a platform that every concept is kind of independent. How do you handle the security? Not just anybody can call your payment service. How is that? Um, so the question is, how do we handle security for our services? Uh, so we use OAuth 2 um, to deal with uh, tokens and stuff. So that, that's essentially what we do. Um, so if you don't have, if you're not interacting with our system, you don't have an account, you can't make requests. You're saying an account token, not a credit card token. Correct, yeah. So, um, so we essentially maintain uh, relationships with the payment processors. And then we allow, uh, right now, two people to interact with our payment service. Uh, but we secure it that way. So does that go for your um, internal API calls as well? Yeah, so yeah, every single API call in our system uses OAuth. So you have your own uh, personal credentials mm -hmm. that you're using for security. Yep. Yeah, we have our own OAuth provider, which deals with um, accounts for those purposes, like machine accounts, stuff like that. Um, so that's where all of our secure, our, authentic our authentication happens. So the, 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 you have several uh, separate services um, that provide the portions of your API. Uh, yeah, so any cl any client, is that what you're asking about? Um, or do you have a single API, or do you have uh, the API broken into segments? Um, so it is broken into segments, uh, but it looks as if it's one single API. So it, you, you essentially hit this API endpoint, which houses everything, but it's routed to tons of different apps. Um, how do you, now, a lot of this stuff and a lot of your reasoning was about just de decoupling and mm -hmm and adhering to like single responsibility principle. Um, can't you do a lot of that still within a monolithic app? Mm -hmm. So his question is, the, the idea is, you know, we're kind of separating concepts. So we're, we're using single responsibility principle and dealing with individual concepts. Can you not do that in a monolithic app? Yes, you absolutely can. So the reason we went from monolith to SOA is because we wanted to provide that platform that, all, that any app can use. But if you don't have that requirement, if you don't, have the need to expose something in that way, then I would absolutely not go SOA. Like it's, it's way more work than it's worth for that particular case. Yeah. Uh, just as far as enrichment for that particular question, there was a presentation given at RailsConf 2014 uh, on componentizing, what was it, a Rails application? That kind of is that stopgap. Before you go SOA, try this first, mm -hmm. where you kind of start isolating components within an application, and then what was it? If you need to, then you split them. Yeah, which we actually went kind of down that path. Like we started making Rails engines internally that were, you know, the services so we could deal with them independently. But it became a nightmare to manage. It was, it was enough complexity that we might as well just go this route instead. For us. So what is the just between a little SOA and a microservices with a managed framework? Okay, so the question is what what is kind of the difference between a a regular SOA and then using microservices. Um, you know, in my opinion, there isn't 
there isn't a ton of difference. Like the, I mean, the main difference would be that uh, microservices is more geared towards um, one job, one very specific thing that I can distribute. So the, the benefit to doing that is now you've got different versions that you distribute just a whole different app. So you've got this one service that exists and then you need to change something about it. So you just deploy a different one. So now you've got a lot easier management time of versioning and that, that sort of thing. But uh, for the most part, they're, they're similar in concept to like from, from a high level. So you mentioned like having like lots of like big, like what if you spent a lot of bigger boxes or whatnot and that will just take forever. But what do you do for your development environments to just have? Okay, so this question is what do we do for our development environment? So because we put everything through um, that one services endpoint, so since we're not treating them as if they are independent um, services, we kind of cheat in our local environment. Yeah, and just put them internally so there's a reverse proxy that sits on top. We use um, Apache, so it sits on top, and that's, that deals with all of our routing for us. I've done similar things when I just use the Docker and Docker Yeah, so that's, that's probably where we're going, yeah. uh, but at present we haven't got through all of our Docker infrastructure. Okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, how do you handle uh, like the whole orchestration of the application might have trouble switching over to a source-oriented architecture and that they want to develop against the entire stack of everything. Mm -hmm. And so you might get a lot of pushback in that way. How do you handle that? So the question is, how do you deal with you know people who or developers who are kind of used to monolithic app and don't really understand and are not able to think about things kind of independently? How do you deal with that? Um, so for us, we kind of split the responsibility around someone who's building the app that consumes our platform and people who are building the, the platform that exists. Um, so we, we follow something which has some contention where we basically have a platform team uh, which uh, deals with you know, building out the, the services and then, we deal, and then the other team is people who are consume, consuming it, uh, consuming our platform. So we essentially shifted that way so that we have several teams of people who can um, interact with the monolithic style. So they're looking at I hit this API endpoint, it has these 15 services in it. I just ask it for a product and it gives me back all this information. So they don't have to think of it as a decoupled thing. They think of the platform as this monolithic app, essentially. Um, but it's not under the hood. So we essentially split organizationally on who wants to understand this and who doesn't. I don't know if that's the right answer, but that's what we did. Uh, so the question is, did we notice any real slowdown in response time? Um, not, we haven't really. Um, the, our biggest bottleneck for response time is Braintree. Um, three seconds response time. So uh, they're, they're kind of our biggest um, problem right now. But the, the whole idea of that container for dealing with it is, so that if we do notice them, and we probably will this next year um, as we get into more of our season, uh, once we notice them, that's when we would take it and spin it up in five different services. Like our payment service right now exists in three different um, three different deployments essentially. So it's that's how we deal with that scalability problem right now. Okay, thank you very much.